Hello and welcome to another episode of Refining Your Paramotor Skills. AJ's got some great stuff for you today and we're really excited for you to enjoy it. Check out our entire series in the playlist down below or in any of the links in the description. Have a great day, enjoy the video. Hello aviators, I'm AJ Gowen and I'm the lead instructor at Aviator Paramotor. This is gonna be another video here at the Red Barn. Uh, this time it's gonna be covering energy management. Energy is not some kind of mythical spell that's been placed on your wing. You can just think of it as airspeed or momentum and understanding that is automatically gonna make you a better pilot. So this is a pretty good video that maybe you understood the basics of it when you were in training, but now that you're home flying, uh, and you've got some experience under your belt, this is gonna really dive into why certain things happen. Different wings carry different amounts of energy, and that can be changed by loading the glider more heavily or less lightly. Um, you can also change your energy in your wing by uh, pulling brakes or pulling energy out of the wing, which changes the angle of attack of the wing. You can also let trims in or out. You can use speed bar. You can enter or exit steep maneuvers. All these things are gonna change the energy of the wing, causing you to fly at a faster or a slower airspeed, therefore changing the energy of the wing. This video is not meant to be a replacement for actual instruction. This is with the understanding that you've already got a base foundation of instruction. This is more meant to be a better understanding of why certain things happen while you're out flying. Maybe sometimes you're out flying and you come in for a landing and sometimes you have to pull a lot of brake as you land and sometimes you have to pull very little brake. This is gonna dive into those very little nuanced things, not meant to be a replacement for actual instruction. So just a quick disclaimer for brake positions and hand positions in flight. When I say uh, hands down to your shoulders and hold, it's relative. Uh, when I say that, I'm referring to the wings that we use at our school here. At Aviator Paramotor, we use Mojo Powers and Spider 3s and Kona 2s. All the brakes are tied to a position where they can be safely flown in a configuration at shoulder height. Typically, our, our shoulders and up is going to be our green zone. Our shoulders down to our nipples is our yellow zone. And the only time we're ever getting to our nipples and below is for that final flare on landing. So just keep that as a relative term and don't use that for your specific wing. Trims change the wing's angle of attack. What is the angle of attack? Well, that's the, where the wing's cord meets the relative wind. So as the angle of attack increases, the cord of the wing increases, or steepens rather, and the relative wind tends to hit the wing. As you increase that angle of attack, you can think slower airspeed, more lift. Now there is a point of no return where the angle of attack gets too high, that it causes a big disturbance of air, therefore stalling the wing. That in combination with airspeed being slowered, uh, can cause the wing to stall. Not a very safe configuration, something that we want to stay away from as much as possible. Adjusting your trims in would be basically trimming your wing to slow configuration and trimming out, pressing those buckles and letting your trims out is going to make for a slower angle of attack, therefore increasing your airspeed, increasing your momentum, which therefore basically translates into more energy into the wing. Typically you want to launch on most wings at about neutral position. Um, this is to allow the wing to shoot up fast, get above your head, but not so much that you have to run really fast to get off the ground. Typically what we tell students to launch, um, what we want to do is inflate the wing, release the A's, control the wing. But after we've got control of that wing, we use a little bit of brace to control. We want those hands to slowly go back up and then start to roll into that power, right? We're rolling into full power, allowing those hands to go up. And what we're doing here is trying to get that wing flying at its fastest airspeed configuration as possible, getting as much energy into the wing as possible by using that power and not using any brake inputs. Once we've done that and we've got to the point where, man, I don't think I can run any faster, that's when you can pull just a little bit of those brakes. And what ends up happening is you change the angle of attack of that wing, increasing in that cord basically, to the relative wind, allowing you to lift off the ground a little bit sooner than you would have if you would not have pulled brakes. But that being said, anytime you use brakes, you're pulling energy out of that wing. And it's not necessarily a bad, bad thing necessarily until you get to the point of no return where you've pulled too much brake and now the wing is stalled and you don't have any more brakes to pull basically to land safely. So what we like to do is pull a little bit of brake to get off the ground, maybe one or two inches, maybe even three inches. But as soon as you get off that ground, start to slowly release that pressure, getting those hands back up and get that energy built back into the wing. 
that's going to give you more room for error. Let's say you hit a gust of wind or a gust of wind stops and you come back down and you have to run again. Well, you can pull those brakes that could save you. Let's say your motor died, for example, your motor dies and you got to come back around for a landing. Well, if you've already got your brakes down to your shoulders or your nipples, then there's a potential that you're not going to have hardly any energy in that wing left to, to flare, to land, basically. So you're going to touch down pretty hard. The idea being that you want as much energy into that wing at all times as possible. And the way that you can do that is using just enough brakes to get yourself off the ground, releasing that, and going about straight and level flight. Anytime that you pull brakes, whether it be one side or the other, you're pulling energy out of that wing. Now, that's one of the main ways that we turn, by pulling brakes. So as you pull that brake to turn, that's changing the angle of attack of one side of that wing, therefore causing it to want to turn to that left side. Uh, as you get more aggressive with that, you can essentially stall or spin that side of the wing. Now that's a pretty aggressive turn, but a more effective way to turn is to weight shift. I like to say that weight shifting is at least 50% of your turn. Uh, even on some beginner wings, if you time that weight shift appropriately at the right time, you can get that wing upside down within two to three rotations without ever even using brakes. So it's a good idea to really get and develop a good habit of weight shift turns. And when I say weight shift, I don't mean just take your right foot and stand on your left knee. We're talking about actual weight shift turn. You don't even necessarily need to cross your legs. You can just basically get that right butt cheek out of your seat and get that head all the way back over to behind that riser on one side. If you do that appropriately, you're weighting all of your weight on that one riser, and this one's gonna go up, allowing for about half of your turn. But if you do that and you time it correctly in combination with that two-stage brake pull, you can do some pretty nice turns. The reason why we have students at first cross their legs is just because it's a little more comfortable, but that's not really doing anything unless you get that right butt out of the actual seat. Uh, the reason why I'm bringing all this up uh, is because by weight shifting and doing half of your turn as a weight shift, you're not pulling energy out of the wing. You're, it doesn't really disturb the airflow of the wing nearly as much as actually pulling brake. So I just want you guys to be aware that uh, you should really try and develop these good habits of weight shifting properly through all your turns. Uh, and if you do that and it becomes a good habit, eventually it's gonna make all your further developments or all your further skill building much, much easier because you're already got that fundamental of, of weight shifting at the right time down. One of the other acting forces that you can use your brakes for is to um, do a turn. Obviously you'll weight shift over, do your two stage turn to enter the roll and the turn, but then you can actually push out on your both of your brakes. What's happening here is you're cupping the whole trailing edge of that wing, basically changing the angle of attack, causing you to pivot around the object faster. If you fly airplanes or understand general aviation, it's the equivalent of banking into a turn with your aileron and then pulling your yoke back to allow you to pivot around an object. It's essentially the same thing. Uh, just know that when you start to pull those main brakes out, uh, you're obviously pulling energy out of the wing and you're closer to a stall. So you need to be uh, really understand your stall configuration of your wing. Pulling brakes will change the angle of attack of the wing pretty quickly. Um, one of the skills that's needed for foot dragging is being able to modulate throttle with brakes simultaneously. And the reason why that is is because you're maintaining a level altitude inches above or uh, on the ground basically, and there's not really a whole lot of room for air. The problem is, is that the throttle increases, first off, are very hard to be very smooth with and not very consistent, especially if you're in that middle range of the throttle, it wants to jump between the low jet and the high jet. But more importantly, the delay between the prop spooling up and actually creating thrust and then you penduluming out underneath the wing is about a three second delay. So that's not fast enough for you to actually or, or accurately make corrections to stay foot dragging the ground with just the throttle. So what we use is our brakes. It's the combination of using our brakes to get that instant lift. By pulling brakes down, it's quick. It's boom, you're already lifting back up. Once you pull those brakes, the angle of attack changes where you get instant lift, but it's momentary. The wing is going to start to slowly surge back forward, therefore causing you to come back down. But in that meantime, you're slowly ramping into that power as you raise those brakes back up. So the combination between pulling brakes and adding power and then releasing brakes, that's going to allow you to foot drag very nice. The reason why I bring up the, uh, the instant effect of brake pulling is because it does happen instantly, but the problem is, is that it's momentary and we don't have a whole lot of brakes to pull to use. If we pull too much, we end up stalling the wing. 
And stalling a wing is not a pretty sight for a paraglider. It's a soft wing canopy. And what ends up happening is the wing falls back, it goes soft, and then the wing shoots forward after your hands go back up. But that's typically too late and the results are never pretty, so. We talked about when you do your launch and you pull a little bit of brakes to change the angle of attack to get off the ground. If you release those brakes slowly, everything goes great. You fly up straight and level and nothing happens. But let's say you use too much brakes to get off the ground. You know, let's say you bear your brakes. It allows you to get off the ground momentarily, but if you continue to hold those brakes, you stall the wing, you come back down. But let's say you go hands up quickly. That wing surges forward. And the reason why it surges forward is because it wants to fly at what's known as trim speed. Trim speed is where your brakes are not being applied and your trimmers are set to a fixed position. Uh, no speed bar applied, basically there's no outside forces, that's trim speed. So what we like to have students do is when they come in for a landing, we want to come in with plenty of altitude, 150 feet, 200 feet, uh, something like that. And the reason being is because that gives them plenty of time to get out of the seat, come all the way down to idle, get those hands all the way up and go through all their landing procedures. That also allows the wing to surge forward and then level off and then surge forward and level off. Typically about two pitch oscillations, the wing starts to find where it wants to fly, trim speed. And once it finds that trim speed, then it's gonna be on a very straight uh, and easy to understand glide slope as you come down. But anytime you make any kind of corrections, whether it be a one inch left adjustment to get back on your spot that you're trying to land on, or, or, or maybe even a big turn, you're pulling energy out of that wing. So let's say you made that small adjustment and then you released. Well, most likely all you did was get yourself into a little bit of a roll oscillation, but what you're also going to do is start a small, small pitch oscillation again. And so sometimes what happens is, is students make corrections to come in for a landing and they don't understand where their wing is at in relation to the energy management. And so the wing surges forward and they end up having to pull a lot of brakes at the last second to level back off. But then sometimes the opposite of that happens. Sometimes you pull uh, brakes and then at like say 40 or 50 feet, you release them. The wings are just forward, but then it levels off automatically, maybe two or three feet above the ground. And you're like, man, when am I gonna touch down? Why am I not touching down? And then eventually you get to pull your pressure to do that final flare for your landing. The reason why you would do this is maybe gusty conditions. It gives you a little more room for error to come in when it's kind of a gustier condition. But what happened there was is that you can time this correctly and pull your brakes down to your shoulders and hold them because for the wings that we use here at our school, uh, we can pull our brakes down to our shoulders and not have to worry about stalling our wing. Hold, 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 and you get down to about 50 feet. Your hands start to go back up. The wing surges forward. It builds up that energy that it wants to fly at at trim speed, levels off, and then you can use that extra little energy to foot drag or do a nice little flare landing. So. Uh, that's why there's different types of landing techniques, but sometimes why you have to pull more brakes on your landings than other times is because in relation to the energy of the wing and where that's at. Uh, it's kind of scary at first to do this uh, because you got to embrace the ground rush. You have to embrace that because it's actually safer to come in with a little more energy and gives you that extra room for error for flaring if that gust were to hit or you, maybe you just mistimed it. Um, you've got that extra energy in the wing to use those brakes to level yourself back off. Using this method of pulling brakes and then allowing the wing to surge forward by going hands up, um, that's going to need to be done at above 50 feet. That's going to give you that room for error. Allow that wing to surge forward, level off, and swoop down. If you do that below 50 feet, what ends up happening is that wing ends up surging forward like it's supposed to to build up its energy, but it takes about 30 to 40 feet for that wing to surge forward and level off. So if you're at 15 feet when you release those brakes, you're gonna start rushing at that ground really fast and you're gonna to have to use all those brakes just to level off. Otherwise, you're gonna hit the ground pretty hard. Um, probably not gonna to be totally hurt or anything, but it's not gonna be the best scenario. You want to do this at no lower than 50 feet. So you can use this for several different reasons, whether it be turbulent conditions, but you can also use it if you're coming in for a landing and maybe you don't have enough altitude to maybe do an S-turn or a 360. Uh, but you're gonna overshoot your LZ. Let's say you have a relatively small or short LZ. You can use this method by pulling these brakes down to your shoulders and holding to change your glide slope. And what ends up happening is most of these paragliders that we fly have a, a relative nine to one glide ratio. And what that means is that if you're a mile high, you're gonna glide out nine miles. So that's a pretty high efficiency for a paragliding wing. Uh, so imagine if you start to pull brakes and change that angle of attack, you're not going to go down any faster. You're not going to slow your descent. Uh, all you're going to do is change your glide slope. 
And so what that's going to do is instead of it being like a 9 to 1 glide ratio, you may change it to something more like a 6 to 1 glide ratio. So instead of landing right next to the barbed wire fence, you're going to land 30 feet away from the barbed wire fence. But that being said, you want to make sure that those hands go back up at about 50 feet and allow that wing to surge forward and build up that energy so that you come down to land. If you continue to hold that brake, you're going to come down probably okay. Nothing bad is going to happen, but it's going to be a, a little bit more rough of a landing. You can imagine jumping out of the back of a truck with a paramotor on your, on your back. So you want to embrace that ground rush and then kind of use a little bit of extra brakes and then swoop up at the last second and pop back up. If you swoop down, do a little foot drag, and then pop up at the last second and then land, you know that you've bled off every ounce of energy out of that wing for that landing, uh, where you basically don't have to run at all once you touch down. It's very common that when students are coming in for a landing, they don't want to embrace that ground rush, and they start to look down at the ground, and they get ground rush basically, but they have no perspective to, as to how high they actually are. And so they start pulling too much brakes too soon, and they're not necessarily stalling the wing yet, but they are pulling energy out of the wing. And so instead of getting that nice, smooth, swoopy, soft butterfly with sore feet landing, they're getting more of a lawn dart style landing. They're pulling brakes and, and pulling energy out of the wing, and they basically come down just like straight until they touch down into the ground, as opposed to getting that little swoop and then pop up at the last second. And that's the more desired landing. It's just better for our knees and our back, and it's just a better experience in general. And there's nothing wrong with coming down and landing straight down like this, especially if you're trying to do necessarily a spot landing, but it may not be the desired effect that you're looking for. It's not necessarily unsafe, but you have less room for air and it may be a little more abrupt than you were expecting. Times that you would use brakes while in flight are obviously to turn, but like I say, I'd like to do weight shift with that turn. The other time you may use your brakes is to do a maneuver of some sort, um, but also you can use your brakes to slow that airspeed. Right? Let's say you're flying up next to somebody, like if you watch the Paradigm Aerobatics team, we'll use our brakes uh, to get up next to somebody so that we can do a formation flight. Uh, that's how you also wing bump buddies. And again, I'm not going out and suggesting that you go out and wing bump your buddy because you watch this video, right? This is just for understanding. But you can use your brakes to slow your airspeed um, and change by changing the angle of attack of the wing. But again, it's relative to your wing, your wing loading, uh, various other factors where you need to know the stall point of that wing because there is a point where it can become extremely dangerous if you're just pulling and holding brakes in flight. Multiple acting forces can cause the wing to build up more energy. Um, speed bar and trims, they basically do the same thing, just in different ways. One is by releasing the rear risers and the other is by pulling the front of the risers down. Essentially doing the exact same thing through the assortments of pulleys in the risers, but both essentially allow the wing to fly at a faster airspeed, air therefore carrying more energy. Uh, if you pull those trims in really quick, what you'll notice is that your angle of attack changes and you balloon up. It's the exact same thing as if you were to dump your speed bar. Let's say you're on full speed bar and you dump it, the wing's angle of attack increases, therefore you get instant lift. But it is momentary, the wing will eventually start to level back off and you will fly out straight and level. A very important thing to consider is, uh, in understanding this is that wings will fly faster than their trim speed, faster than what they're designed to fly or what they want to fly at, rather. A wing over will carry more energy, a round spiral, you can think of like a, a wing going into a constant circle and that nose will start to slowly nose down, that will carry way more energy than what that wing wants to fly at. Uh, it's also extremely dangerous and round spirals will build very, very quickly to the point where you can actually black out within a couple of rotations. They're very dangerous beyond appearance and so I would not recommend going out and trying any of these maneuvers. But for our understanding, just know that if you go into a steep maneuver, these wings will carry more energy than what they're intended to fly at. And what ends up happening is that, let's say you get yourself into the situation where you've pulled too much brake and you held it for too long. What ends up happening is that wing starts to go into that turn, but that nose starts to roll down like this. When that wing starts at about 90 degrees and then rolls down to about 45 degrees, that's about the point where it's not necessarily unsafe, but it's gonna build quickly. But once you get about 45 degrees and below, this is where it builds very, very fast and very violently. So when you get down into here, you start to get into these nose down spiral situations. And um, on some wings, they can lock into these configurations and you actually have to active pilot yourself out of it. The problem with this being is that at this point, you've built up so much energy probably two to three, maybe even four times more energy than what it wants to fly at, at its trim speed. So you're gonna to have to dissipate all this extra energy. And if you just pull the outside brake 
or if you just go hands up, that wing's gonna come out of there super violent and you're gonna balloon up. This wing wants to fly to airspeed and when you exit that turn, it's gonna balloon up like this. And maybe even to the point like where you come over like this, you're a pendulum on this wing and you end up coming back and falling into your wing. And it's what's known as gift wrapping. If you wanna see some extravagant events, you can watch that on uh, YouTube. There's plenty of uh, YouTube videos of people doing this in SIAV clinics. So this is not meant to be uh, instruction on how to do these maneuvers, but just so you know, for understanding, the best way to exit these maneuvers is to very, very, very slowly exit these maneuvers. Once you've gotten yourself into this maneuver, the best way to do it is just ride it out and very slowly exit this turn. What ends up happening is, let's say you accidentally went into a 45 degree spiral and you're just like riding it around. Not necessarily the most unsafe, but it's not probably where you wanted to be. So the best way to exit this is just to slowly let off that inside brake that got you into that turn to begin with. And when I say slowly, not over the course of three seconds, I mean really for a long period of time, maybe 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds. Who knows how long it's gonna take, depending on your wing loading and the energy your wing is carrying. Just know that it may take one, two, even three full rotations, 360s, to bleed all that energy out of that wing. And so what ends up happening is, is you went into this nose down turn, you're exiting it now, and you just come, your wings start to stand back up straight, and then you slowly exit that turn. And just bleed all the energy off until the wing starts to come back up, and then you fly straight and level. If you just dump that brake, even on, even on a less aggressive spiral, you can still get to the point where it becomes dangerous, your lines go slack, and you fall through, and the wing darts forward. And if you don't check that wing appropriately, you can gift wrap yourself even still. Adding a bigger motor is really only gonna allow you to climb faster. It's not gonna allow you to fly at a faster forward momentum. It's only going to allow you to climb faster. What ends up happening is you end up adding power. The wing's angle of attack increases, basically falling back behind you. Your thrust pushes you up and you just end up climbing faster. So there's a lot of topics inside of energy management. It basically relates to anything and everything in flying. Uh, anything and everything can be attributed to energy management. So uh, once you have a really firm grasp on this, it's really gonna make you a better pilot so that you can understand exactly what's happening and why it's happening. So that's it guys, I hope you enjoyed and I look forward to seeing you guys in the future videos.